And so I think there's a class action lawsuit in the waiting here, because if you look at every mission statement of every college, it always starts off with some claim about we don't teach you what to Mm -hmm. think. We teach you how to think Mm -hmm. critical thinking skills, Mm -hmm. leaders of tomorrow. Right. Mm -hmm. And not only is there no. All right. For one thing, if this was a drug, the FDA would ban it. You cannot claim benefits (laughs) and then not show evidence that they're there. So they currently provide none. Like, okay, you told us you were teaching critical thinking Mm -hmm. skills. What's the evidence that you are? Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't test for that. You know, we don't Mm -hmm. measure that. Well, okay, is that a benefit? Mm -hmm. And then there's evidence against it. So there is 90 years of research in the field of educational psychology on this question of what they call transfer of learning. Meaning if you learn one domain, can you extract lessons from that domain and then pl- apply them to a new problem or something mm-hmm. you encounter? Turns out there's no, we don't know how to do this. Mm-hmm. Like there's no evidence colleges do mm-hmm. this or whatever. So th- the idea that colleges are like somehow imparting these intangible mm-hmm. skills, I am greatly, greatly mm-hmm. skeptical of based on that. I- Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And this week, we have another fantastic episode for you. Um, A little bit different, someone from the business world today, we had on Michael Gibson, who's the co-founder of the 1517 Fund, a venture capital fund investing in teams led by dropouts, the uncredentialed, and renegade scientists. But before I tell you a little bit more about him. Be sure to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find information about all of our upcoming programs, the backlog of this show, getting close to 100 episodes now, and so much more. Um, But Michael is a a fantastic uh, listen, one of the most fun episodes we've had taping yet. He um, uh, has obviously uh, been focused on for many years a lot of the things we care about here at American Moment, which is the idea that the existing systems of credentialing are terrible and need to be uh, deeply reformed. And so he just has a new book out called Paper Belt on Fire, where he just roasts all of these different entities and institutions, showing them to be as morally and substantively bankrupt as we know them to be. He has a very interesting background himself. I won't spoil it too much because the the kind of cold, what's your background is one of the best ones of that we've ever done on this show. So um, we hope you listen through to the end. What you, would you think about that, Nick? This episode totally uh, blew my mind. I mean, we were talking about it, you know, uh, in between uh, the actual recording and, you know, recording this intro. Like, I uh, kind of had to force myself to jump in. I kind of just wanted to be the first person to to listen uh, uh, to the episode. I learned, you know, so much. Um, and he had a lot of a lot of interesting ideas, um, you know, about the future of American education and, and discovery. Um, so, yeah, real, real solid episode. We'll go now to Michael Gibson, the partner of the 1517 Fund and the author of Paper Belt on Fire. Michael, thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So for someone who rails against educational institutions a lot, you have a pretty long history in that world yourself. Tell us tell us the story of your background and then how you ended up uh, railing against um, all of the institutions that are sacred and, and pietous in American life. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, I work in venture capital now. People, especially on uni- university campuses, will want to know, well, how do you get a job in venture capital? And I'll tell them my story, and it just doesn't make sense because it's, <laughs> you know, uh, Tarzan swinging vine to vine. Um, so I, I thought I was going to be a professor of philosophy. I studied the classics, um, ancient Greek and Latin, really drawn to the ancient philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, and then. Uh, political philosophy and moral philosophy drew my interest. So I was working towards a doctorate and, um, you know, I, I just reached a point where I realized I didn't want to be a teacher. I really wanted to be a writer. I, I, it's one of these, uh, Rene Girard, the French literary theorist, has this idea of mimetic rivalry where you see people and you want to imitate them and, and want what they want. And so when I was 19, uh, you know, there were some writers who really stood out to me. One was T.S. Eliot, the mm-hmm. poet, um, really loved Eliot's work. And on the back of his books, uh, you can read he has a Ph.D. in philosophy from Harvard. <laughs> and then the second writer was Tom Wolfe. So uh, I thought, you know, I, I encountered Wolfe as, as the novelist, Bonfire of the Vanities, but his journalism just set me on fire. I love his uh, The Right Stuff, uh, the collections in the 60s. 
in and Wolf too. When I saw the you know his little bio on the back of the book with a picture and underneath it, he is a PhD in American Studies from uh, Yale. So I I thought okay, if I'm going to write like a couple of my heroes, maybe I need to spend some time in academia. Well, that was foolish. Right? <laughs> so it reached a point where I thought um, I was in the basement at a bookstore. I went to Oxford mm -hmm. uh, in for graduate school and. I was in a basement of a bookstore in Oxford and came across um, a collection of uh, pieces that Tom Wolfe put together for the new journalism. So the new journalism was this idea that Wolfe was a part of this movement where can we use the tools of fiction to tell true stories? Um, so typical newspaper stories, the lead, who, what, why, and where, very dry. Mm -hmm. But can we use storytelling to uh, reach the emotional truth of something? And I, I encountering this uh, Wolf's preface of that book, I was like, yeah, what am I doing <laughs> in university? Um, so I, that, that was the – and then I was at a conference once, and I was also – I gave a talk on a paper I wrote. 10 people in the room. I convinced none of them of anything. So I, th I, I thought, okay, I, I, I'm going to leave. Uh, well, I happened to be dating someone at uh, who lived in um, in Cambridge. She went to Harvard, uh, so I moved there and um, just happened to get a job at a magazine MIT owns, Technology Review. It's their alumni magazine, but reaches a broader audience. Um, and suddenly, it was baptism by fire into science and tech. I, I, I mean, I obviously had some grounding in in the sciences, but. But this was uh, wholly new to me, and 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 it was a lot of fun in the sense of I'd I'd get assigned a story and I'd have to go cover, you know I'd have to get up to speed, and and the luxury was I could reach out to any professor, uh, at MIT, and then anywhere else in Boston, and they'd pretty much be happy to talk to me on something. Mm -hmm. All right, so now I'm a journalist, and then I interview someone. This is 2007, and I uh, interviewed Max Levchin, CTO of PayPal, when the company was sold to eBay, and. Uh, I didn't, I knew what PayPal was, but I didn't know the people who created it. And this is 2007. So, um, some of these names were, were new to me. So, uh, you know, Lev Chin, I said, what would you do differently, uh, with your life? Um, you sold the company to eBay 1.5 billion. I don't know what your cut was, but probably pretty great. What would you do differently? And he said, well, yeah, after we sold the company, I toured, I, I traveled the world. I lived on a beach and it was the worst year of my life. And that alone, I said, geez, what do you mean? Uh, who is this guy I was thinking? And he said, yeah, you know, all my friends were out there creating great companies and I was just consuming. I wasn't producing. I was like, well, who are your friends? And then he went through some of that, what, what's now known as the PayPal mafia. So the people who built PayPal, after they uh, left PayPal, they had extraordinary careers doing other. I mean, basically the second wave of internet companies are all PayPal alum. So Reed Hoffman built LinkedIn, Steve Chen, YouTube, Jeremy Stoppelman, Yelp. Uh, the most famous is Elon Musk, who at the time had just started his rocket company, an electric car company. And I'm, just, I'm like, who are these characters? Yeah. And then the last was uh, this vaguely intellectual libertarian hedge fund manager, Peter Thiel. Um, so that was the first time I encountered Peter's name. And so learning about him, I was like, OK, this is interesting. I, uh, I did reach out to his fund because they said they were looking to hire people, but no one responded. Um, but I was at, you know, fast forward a year, I was at a party and I meet two people who worked for Peter. Um, they mentioned they're looking for a researcher writer. I was freelancing at the time and, uh, I thought, okay, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. So then I end up in an interview with Peter and we're just talking philosophy. You know, we're not even talking finance. And at the end of the interview, he asked me if I would help him teach a class at Stanford law school on philosophy and technology. And I, I said, okay, this is too interesting to pass up. So I said, yes. All right. So that uh, already is like, okay, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, so he hires me. He says, we'll make you an analyst at the hedge fund. Um, and you help me teach this class. I show up to work the first day. And I guess he had been on a plane back from New York to San Francisco with a couple other people, Jim O'Neill and uh, Luke Nozick. Um, he's a PayPal alum. And uh, they had this idea to just pay people to leave college. That, that was the general idea. It's like, well, hey, we've worked with so many people who don't have college degrees. What if we, you know, that uh, why do banks, like this bank robber was asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. <laughs> that, that was the idea. It's like, wow, all of America, like all like, you know, talented people, there's no other path right now 
to a successful, rewarding career. So what if we jailbreak them? Mm -hmm. And then I show up to work and and Jim O'Neill comes to my desk and he's like, oh, on the plane ride back from New York, we had this idea, anti-road scholarship was the idea Mm -hmm. at the time. And I, I, having been at Oxford, I knew a lot of roadies and they can be, you know, very oily, credentialist hounds Mm -hmm. and, you know, very polished. Um, And right away I said, okay, this is great. And mm-hmm. I, I, I came on board. We go to Peter's house. I'm in a car. So the idea was there was a conference that day mm-hmm. and TechCrunch Disrupt, big tech conference. And Peter was going to announce this fellowship. So we had to, it's like, how much money are we giving? What do we call this thing? How many years mm-hmm. is it on the fly just coming up with these ideas? Mm-hmm. And then Peter's out there being interviewed by a journalist um, and talking in the present tense like this program exists. <laughs> like we're, we're taking applications and so on. So I called my mom and uh, stepdad at the end of that day. And I just remember saying, wow, this is my first day of work. I don't know what uh, what tomorrow will bring. I can tell you the exact day, September 27th, 2010, because it was my first day. Um, the, the notable fact was that um, – the, the movie The Social Network was set to come out that Friday. This is how long ago that is. I see. And the script had been leaked. Aaron Sorkin penned the script. Brilliant. A dialogue. I, th- I think it's a great movie. But what was clear was that uh, Z- both Zuckerberg and Peter were going to be negatively portrayed. Sorkin describes Peter as, you know, Gordon Gecko uh, wannabe in the script. And and so I think Peter wanted to get, you know, get the jump on that with, mm-hmm. by announcing something cool and new. And then I ended up co-running that program for, for f- the first five years of it, its existence. So yeah, as I said, crazy story. Mm-hmm. I can't, if I tell that to someone like, Oh, here's something to learn for your career. It's not, really, Oh, go to grad school, drop out, become a journalist, meet mm-hmm. this uh, tech billionaire. Mm-hmm. I think that might be one of the craziest <laughs> opening stories we've ever had on the show. <laughs> So, yeah. so, so tell me about the fellows, mm-hmm. right? Because I, I, you know, having done programs, like I cohorts mature and and change over time, or mature yeah. is the wrong word. They change over time. Once something exists, right? You know, I guess the magnetic desire takes over. Like the first yeah. class of people to apply for a teal fellowship, strike me as something very different than the tenth. Yeah, or, you know, or however, whichever class you guys are on now. Um, you know, obviously what defined many of these people was their their individuality, but was mm. there any commonality in their individuality? What kinds of people did the program attract in its first few years? Uh, it's interesting. Like you would think when you do look at something like the Rhodes Scholarship, it so clearly attracts prestige. So, you know, people with perfect uh test scores and grades and recommendations and so on. We didn't get that person. Mm -hmm. There were a few of them in our applicant pool, but uh, it was interesting is like the ones who stood out in the end, there was something eccentric and off about them Mm -hmm. in some, in, in different ways. Uh, To take one example would be like, I mean, Laura Deming is probably traditional in some ways. Mm -hmm. So she uh, was a sophomore at MIT when she dropped out, but she was 16. Mm -hmm. And then she had been working in uh, labs on anti-aging stuff, not like uh, cosmetics, but like actual uh, therapeutics uh, since she was 12. Um, So that, that, yeah, it was pretty strange. Um, But, you know, what they all had in common was just like this sort of a combination of vision and practicality that it wasn't just about like pretending to like, Hey, let's talk about asteroid mining, Mm -hmm. but to to then go and know something about it Mm -hmm. and what it would take Mm -hmm. because the first day they all met, we had a, Mm -hmm. uh, a finalist weekend. So, you know, final round interviews for about 50 or so to narrow it down to 20. And I can remember clear, (laughs) like, like uh, as clear as day, the buzz, in the lobby of the Hyatt Hotel on the Embarcadero in San Francisco. And it was just these these 18 and 19, 20, 20 year olds. Yeah, just buzzing, talking about yeah. science and technology and, and what they want to do. So maybe another thing they all had in common was was this intrinsic motivation that there wasn't a sense that like the Teal Fellowship, you know, Peter was pretty famous then, but not like he is now. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't seen as like this, this, uh, yeah, credential or a resume item at, at the time, it was just like, oh, wow, we did bring together interesting people and they're motivated on their own to already be interested in, in these different mm-hmm. things. I'm curious, you know, the the layer or, or the, the dichotomy with the Teal Fellowship that's 
always talked about is college versus non-college. The one that I think yeah. is sometimes less talked about is is theory versus practice. T- t- tell me a little bit about what the what the thesis there was. Was that is is it the case that like you know that that you guys think that that theory is over indexed period, or that mm. there were people who would would learn better by doing what what was the idea behind just go do a project as opposed to use your 100k to go study philosophy by yourself or, or whatever right um well you know we we had a lot to learn um so when w- there were two requirements on the program you had to be 19 and under when you applied um you could not be enrolled in school was the second one so that was a uh, the the more newsworthy condition mm. And then it was a hundred thousand grants over a hundred thousand dollar grant over two years, um, and we were accepting. We were interested in just okay, who are the people who want to use this money towards something interesting? Mm-hmm. And in the first uh, cohort or two, we had people who who were more research oriented. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a young man working on the edge of using a computer language called Haskell programming language. At the time, it wasn't uh, very prominent. And, and he was interested in, in using that to solve theorems in uh, set theory and category theory. Okay, very abstract. Mm-hmm. Um, we had another young man who um, was interested in, in some of the, the backbone of what's become artificial intelligence, so deep learning, um, neural nets. And then, uh, and then a young woman who's working on nonprofit stuff by in, in Africa. So we we did back people who were not just working on startups, mm. but it was interesting to see how they developed in the program. And mm. and one of the benefits of the program was they they got to focus on that. Mm-hmm. So they devoted you know 100 percent of their time pursuing their research project. But it was interesting to see that the off ramp was not as clear. So at the end. You know, how do you get published in respected journals? How do you get invited to conferences or, um, you know, what's the next step it is, is very hard at the theoretical level. So mm-hmm. it was more of that constraint where as the program evolved, it just became clearer and clearer that, OK, well, you know, the people who can survive and thrive out in the wild are, are typically, you know, startup founders yeah. or, or more strictly speaking tech oriented you can never work for anyone again (laughs) you you have to be your own boss (laughs) yeah um that's really interesting so why why the 1517 fund after Mm -hmm. the fellowship was making waves and and uh was very successful for many years why did you and danielle start that Uh, well yeah so we co-ran that program for five years and in that time we had already seen some really promising success stories Mm -hmm. uh the most recent is a young man dylan field founded a company called Figma. It's a design tool, cloud-based design tool in 2012. Um, that was recently purchased by Adobe for 20 billion mm-hmm. announced this fall. So, you know, that was at the, even by 2015, it was clear, you know, Dylan was on his way. Um, but then the most famous is probably Vitalik Buterin. So mm-hmm. we, we gave Vitalik a hundred thousand dollar grant in 2013, helped him launch Ethereum. Um, uh, and, and, you know, even 2015, it was still on the outside, but in, in crypto certainly has taken a beating in the last year. But, you know, it's pretty tremendous success story. So mm-hmm. based on that, we thought, oh, wow, you know, OK, this is nonprofit. It's limited to Peter's generosity. We could be making money. Mm-hmm. No one else out there is there are lots of VC funds out there. Um, most target sectors. Hey, we're investing in biotech or A.I., but no one seemed to be targeting a demographic, which was like, who are these, uh, you know, wizards without credentials, eccentrics, uh, just anyone outside institutions who who are building mm-hmm. things, and uh, and so we launched our fund fifteen seventeen. Um, yeah, I, I I'm a, I'm big on names. This is in my book. Mm-hmm. Like I I think what we name things is important. Mm-hmm. So we uh, and I realized first that people notice the number and ask about it, uh, but the second. A uh, historic thing was a historical n- analogy with the with the Reformation. So famously, you know, it's not verified. It's more of a uh, a story than the truth, perhaps. But Luther nailed his ninety five theses to a church door in fifteen seventeen. Um, what he was protesting against was the sale of indulgences. That's the thing that really pissed him off. Um, the indulgences are a piece of paper, church sold at great cost uh, to absolve you of your sins or you know save you from going to hell. 
Um, so you know, we were we were making this uh, geeky analogy that the current university system bears some resemblance to the corrupt church of the 16th century. <laughs> uh, instead of an indulgence, yeah. it's called a diploma. Yeah. They say it'll save your soul, and it costs quite a bit. And they're building great monuments yeah. off the earnings. Yeah, I love that name a lot more than you probably. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> it's, it's 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 funny. There's um there was this amazing. So Hillary Clinton is apparently the chancellor of some university in England. Is that um, right? I, yeah, she's like very yeah. odd. Um, and uh, there was. Um, there was a, a picture of her in like full regalia because oh, like they're, okay. they're they're much more like you know ornamental oh, about this still this. in the UK uh, a few months ago mm -hmm. or something and uh, and someone had a great quote tweet which you know despite my my religious priors I think is funny it's like you know you know the the, the last unreformed institutions that that still have this much pomp and circumstance left in the world is the catholic church and, right. and universities which like yeah. you know, uh, it's, it's a category I'd like and, to and they're sacred out. Yeah. Like when I, when we started the fellowship, it was clear that not only had we said something mm -hmm. wrong, mm -hmm. we had violated some, mm -hmm. you know, sacred principle. It mm -hmm. was sacrilegious because I, I think that's the only explanation for like how the intensity of, of some of the hatred we we received and pushed back. Um, well, yeah. What what tends to be the profile of some of these, you know, people that end up founding these these profitable companies? I mean, yeah. you say you say, you know, they tend to be eccentric, but mm -hmm. like. What do you what do you mean by that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, one thing we noticed right away was we had an application and we were too imitative of college. Oh, interesting. So we asked for test scores or GPAs and school what school you went to. Um, and what we found out pretty quickly is that those were not good predictors of success. Um, and then some things even became negative signals, like the Intel Science Award. For some reason, the people who, who won that seemed to be very good at pleasing committees yeah. or coming up with ideas that would please a committee uh, instead or of make actually, for good headlines. Yeah. Like X, Y, Z, climate change. Thing, right. You know, uh, and, like, and actually, yeah, there were people where it didn't check yeah. out, too, where it was like and no one had bothered to check because it seemed to meet their priors. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, but the people, yeah, we, we developed a set, a, a list of things that we look for in pe in people. And like the number one thing is, you know, so Peter Thiel, I mentioned big fan of Rene Girard, uh, Girard canvassed the mythologies of the world, um, in, and then even Christianity and, and he's, Girard is famous for his interest in, uh, group dynamics, mob mentality, um, just group think in general and then in particular how that relates to scapegoating mm -hmm. so Girard has this theory that like social order is brought about after you know a scapegoat is sacrificed um and can be blamed on on the social crisis at hand uh that disorder is originally brought about by this mimesis right okay complicated theory but one thing that Girard picked up on was who who is the type of person that the crowd decides should be the scapegoat? Mm -hmm. And Gerard's answer is that it tends to be someone who's an insider and an outsider at once. Someone who, in the words of like the talking heads, strange but not a stranger. And, uh, you know, you can think of Oedipus as a classic example where he... He is uh, the king of the country. He thinks he's from a foreign land, but it turns out he's not. Mm -hmm. So it's like he's he's part of the city, but also not part mm -hmm. of it. Um, but Peter picked up on this as a heuristic for evaluating the types of people he would fund and hire. Um, are they insiders and outsiders to some extent? For instance, could they be so su successful in a rigorous academic field, but kicked out for some reason? Yeah. Or maybe they dropped out like me. Um or, you know, it, it, immigrants are another example where it could be the case that maybe they are a U.S. citizen now, but in other ways, they're not fully part of the culture. So mm -hmm. that gives them an insight into things that maybe someone else doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So that insider outsider polarity, I think, is something that that Peter passed on to mm -hmm. us when looking for fellows. Mm -hmm. um, was there some some way in which they 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 were on the boundary of a field mm -hmm. in some fashion um not and, and gerard's idea was like okay if you're a total foreigner stranger you can't possibly be blamed for the social crisis at hand mm -hmm. on the other hand if you're like in the king's right hand uh you're too close and and no way could you possibly be blamed and so when you look at mythologies the scapegoat is always someone who's this boundary figure and oftentimes the king himself or, or a hero is merely a scapegoat who has avoided death to the mm -hmm. 
to the current time. Um, so yeah, the, the, this kind of stuff informs the way we look at, and it, and it proved true with the with the Teal Fellows mm-hmm. as well, where um, you know they 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 fit some description of that insider outsider, and then there are some other things where. Um, we look at, we don't really have name, you know, we made up names for them. It's like one of them is my colleague's favorite. We call Friday night Dyson sphere. So a Dyson sphere is like the most science fictional example of a technology you could come up with. It's Mm -hmm. could we surround, uh, the sun in some way. I mean, not within the earth, like outside the solar system yeah. with uh, solar panels of some kind and harness the total energy of the sun. Mm-hmm. Um, so we love someone who thinks on that kind of ambitious scale. Mm-hmm. But the Friday night part is they're actually working towards it on Friday night. They're not out yeah. at parties. They're not hanging out at, at the ice cream shop. They're at some hackathon doing something. And we don't even care. I mean, it's funny. It's like sometimes it's cool if it's like, hey, there, here's my lemonade stand. And there's some plausible story that they can tell for um, how they're going to move from this business out to the Dyson Sphere kind mm-hmm. of thing. Uh, so we love that. Now, the last thing, back to the applications. I think it, we learned applications are terrible because – um, they're like fruit. They start off fresh and get rotten pretty fast because mm-hmm. uh, things just change. People change ideas. They move to uh, onto something new. And then the other thing is they're just a snapshot. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I never want to be in a Shark Tank situation where I just met someone and I have to make a decision whether or not to invest. So much of the evaluation is based on their character. So ideally, we know them over time. So that's yeah. why the application wasn't great, too. So we started going out on like, can I encounter someone and then see them work, get to know them over some period of time and then be comfortable investing in them? And so maybe in that respect, it, it, it started to bear more of a resemblance to like NFL or uh, NBA or something where, yeah. God, if you think of all the money that goes into scouting and the draft is still not a science, right? It's like people are um, making bad picks all the time or overlooking talented people. Tom Brady, I guess, big example. Um, so yeah, it's still, it's still more of an art than a science, but it's like, can you get a sense of people's character? Does the existence of programs and institutions like the Teal Fellowship and the 1517 Fund um rely on a status quo that might be eroding so when you guys first launched it in in the early 2010s um i think it was still like truly truly heretical to decry college but like the demographics today are clear like college participation is going down not up and um you know in certain uh, spheres to the point where where you'd have to worry about entryism and gamification, people are like, yeah, I'll I'll not go to college for a few years or whatever. Is the yeah. is the intensity or the value of that signal attenuating over time? Do you think? Uh, yes and no. Um, certainly, the idea of leaving school to work on a tech idea is more mainstream than mm-hmm. it used to be. I think that's true. Um, it's a lot more intelligible even. Mm -hmm. So, you know, young people who's, they have to tell their parents, you know, what are you going to do? It still seems to make sense to the parents. Yeah. I'm going to go with Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. I'm going to do that. (laughs) 10 years ago, not as clear. Um, and then the other thing is like the, I I think in areas where you can directly measure skill, Mm -hmm. that's where college is eroding the fastest. Mm -hmm. And we do see that in engineering. So if, if you, I mean, you could be an avatar with Darth Vader as your pseudonym, and if you have a GitHub repository, so GitHub's a site yeah. where people upload their code and their peers can vet it and vote on it. Um, and you can, that, that's a better resume than a resume. Mm-hmm. That's better than LinkedIn. Yeah. You don't need a college degree. So we know tons of people who have just been hired by all the big tech companies, Amazon, Apple, whoever, just because they can demonstrably show, here's my portfolio and I can do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see people get poached after internships more and more frequently for more and more money. Um, I guess with layoffs, maybe not as much this year, but in general. Um, so, so yeah, that, that, that is happening. I think it's more in the areas where, uh, skills are intangible or, um, where, you know, employers are just looking to hire competent, conscientious, uh, rule followers, Mm -hmm. in which case college is still the best producer of those types of people. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that that will continue until some kind of replacement signal is, is available. So the script that yep. American society is presenting today is that college or some form of higher education is essential for basically everyone. Yeah. Um, I think obviously you disagree with that. Yep. Um, but I, I imagine that the reason is different depending on 
where you are in the hierarchy of American life. The reason why it's maybe a bad idea for, you know, mm. the 17 year old, you know, lower middle class kid in Iowa is different than 150 IQ math genius. Right. Um, I guess, you know, starting at the, the, the most, you know, third, fourth, fifth standard deviation, excellent people. Mm. Why is this system failing them? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is that it's it's just slow uh, and it doesn't really have the agility to to get people out to the frontier of knowledge in a field quickly. Um, so, you know, there's an ec economist from Northwestern, Benjamin Jones, who did some fantastic research into um, just uh, these sort of demographic uh, stats about inventors, scientists, when they do things in their life and how productive they are over time. Um, think of it like with Major League Baseball, you know, career stats. Mm -hmm. And one thing he noticed was like in 1900 uh, or, you know, 100 years ago, um, the average age at which people started their career. So how old were they when they published their first patent, wrote their first paper? Um, he looked at that. He looked at how old were people at their age of greatest achievement. Mm -hmm. So when someone wrote the paper that eventually won them the no Nobel Prize, how old were they? And then he looked at how productive they were over their whole career. How long do careers last for scientists and inventors? Um, and what he found over the last hundred years was that um, all those numbers are getting older. So the age of first invention used to be something like 23. Now it's closer to 30. The age at greatest achievement used to be early 30s. Now it's late 30s. Um, and then the other thing he found is that um, careers, you know, people just aren't productive in their mid to 40s onward. They just, mm. for whatever reason, mortgages, spouses, pets, I don't know, people just aren't as productive as they used to be. So there's a pretty clear trajectory and it's all getting pushed back. Mm -hmm. Why that's bad is is that back end. Mm -hmm. So if imagine in the major leagues, if you couldn't start your career till you were 35 and then you still retired at 45. Mm -hmm. That's just less time to produce on the field. Same is true of science. Mm -hmm. If you're not out there uh, inventing or discovering things in your 20s, mm -hmm. then your career is just going to be truncated. Mm -hmm. So that's Jones's research. His explanation is that the burden of knowledge is higher than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Newtonian mechanics, pretty hard. But when you look at quantum mechanics, boy, is that more complex. Uh, so the theory is like to get out to that frontier requires more and more knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, you need to be in school till you're 33. Mm -hmm. I disagree with that. I think we can all agree that so much time is wasted K through 12 mm -hmm. undergrad uh, and then even and then in the PhD uh, programs. You look at the way the NIH and NSF award grants, it's almost as if the same people have been awarding themselves grants from the early 80s to the present. <laughs> it's like the average age goes up with the age of that group. Um, <laughs> They just don't trust uh, 25 year olds to yeah. run experiments. It's like, oh, it's developing world le levels of lack of trust yeah. in, in that economy where we just don't trust younger people to conduct experiments mm -hmm. or pursue their own research. You have to spend all 15, 18 years accumulating the credentials that will give you the trustworthiness to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the importance of our program when it's at its best, uh, it, it was bringing people to that frontier faster and giving them the resources mm -hmm. to make those explorations. Um, so that's the, you know, someone like Vitalik Buterin who taught himself Mandarin Chinese is is certainly far out there on the standard deviations of talent and and we gave him the resources and maybe the validation to do what he was doing mm -hmm. you know probably do it on his own but still it was great that we supported him um when when th moving down like okay so that's why that's important to us and then there's this background thesis that i think you know we probably don't want to debate too much but certainly in our pro you know teal uh, was one of the early proponents of the ideas that is that we are not making as much progress in science and tech as all the media and press releases would have you believe that in fact since the early 70s the one area where we've seen progress is computers and information technology but when you look at other fields and examine them the rate of progress has slowed down mm -hmm. quite a bit i'll give one stat just to sort of illustrate that if you think of health um, early 1900s, average age life expectancy at birth, something like 45 years. Mm -hmm. um, by 1980, that was up to 73. Mm -hmm. And that was due to sanitation and then also lots of discoveries in medicine and so on. But um, since then, um, you know, life expectancy has gone up like three years. So almost, uh, you know, 40, 
plus years of barely any progress whatsoever. In the United States, it's starting to decline. Well, yeah. And then in the last five, six years, it's either been flat or has declined. And and COVID certainly lowered it, which is the first time in in recorded history. Seems bad. So so that's in that sense, it's like, okay, there was stagnation and now we've regressed. Yeah. Right. So um, this this idea that we're stagnating is important. And, and and that's partly the motivation of, okay, it takes long. It seemed through the traditional mm-hmm. institutions, it takes longer to get to the frontier of knowledge. There's this stagnation. Maybe those institutions are actually part of the reason for it. Not, not the, the, they're not helping. They're actually harming. Uh, so what can we do to free and liberate people to, to get out there and, and make progress? My, my understanding of the field that, that might be the tell on this entire system is that in like the world of real like high mathematics, yeah. like you've got a couple good years in your twenties, and that's and you're basically done. Like those yeah. are your most productive years. No one ever really does anything particularly innovative after a certain point. And yep. there's a lot of set of self-taught geniuses still emerging in that field. And there's relatively low barrier to entry in terms of you don't need you know mm. fifty million dollar lab in order to do is is is. Do you think that that's a good example of a, of a field that kind of tells on the entire rest of academia? I think there is a lot to that. Yeah. I mean, you know, people push back on that, but I think we have to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are there are some psychologists who study this type of thing, mm-hmm. and in every career, there is a trajectory that mm-hmm. looks like a bell curve in terms of, you know, slow beginning, first win. Mm-hmm masterpiece and then a uh, trailing end. Mm-hmm. So it's like Ernest Hemingway in the twenties storms onto the scene with the sun also rises, mm-hmm. follows up with farewell to arms. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a late masterpiece mm-hmm. or there's the, for whom the bell tolls perhaps his masterpiece. Mm-hmm. And then his last work, uh, old man in the sea, you know, mm-hmm. not quite what it was, but still polished and, and strong. Well, Einstein's the same way. Einstein had a miraculous year in 1905, how old was he then? Uh, I can't remember. How, he's in his 20s. Okay. Uh, published three monumental papers, one of them special relativity. Um, and then and then he, uh, general relativity comes 10 years later. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he has a paper in the 1930s on, that, that eventually was refuted, but at least it posed the <laughs> thought experiment about non-locality and quantum yeah. mechanics, right? So it's like you see this, this, uh, uh, meteoric rise, mm-hmm. major contribution mm-hmm. and, and a fade. Um, so that, yeah, there's research to show that holds ac- across a lot of fields. They seem to happen at different times, like writers, novelists can peak in their fifties. Uh, but, uh, but when it comes to the sciences, there seems to be a pretty strong uh, trajectory where, you know, the twenties and thirties are, are usually very productive time periods. Um, so I, and you're right, mathematicians, um, you know, they, they do seem to fade in terms of their, their, their mental agility, chess players. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I don't know why people are resistant to it. It's mm-hmm. like, they don't want to believe there's a biological life mm-hmm. cycle to, uh, creativity, but, but I think it's worth paying attention to, especially if our institutions are going to be optimized towards, uh, you know, cultivating those talents when you kind of see like a kind of like a a cultural pushback at this idea too i see this meme goes around every once in a while it's like all the boomers on facebook like to share it you know the it's like it's never too late you know this person did this (laughs) thing in the 50s um it's never too late to like get started and i've sat there and and thought about (laughs) it like man when i'm 50 like yeah it's too late to get to- <laughs> i don't want to get started yeah man. that's yeah i want to do it now well, there are always outliers mm-hmm. remember it all it's averages mm-hmm. it's like okay yeah there is someone who maybe yeah. made a discovery when they were 60 yeah. but you're yeah. talking about yeah. two degrees of out like outliers among outliers <laughs> yes. yeah and so if, if you're in the yeah. business of trying to scale up the amount of outlier activity in a given civilization then you can't rely on a second order outlier <laughs> possibilities right. in order yeah. to make anything happen. And I, and I think it all everyone in their lives should be optimistic. Like, okay, I can mm-hmm. always pick up that new skill or try that new career. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but, but like, people underestimate, this would be like saying LeBron James. It's like, okay, yeah. I can go pick up <laughs> basketball, but like to say I'm going to become LeBron James in my fifties, is yeah. just absurd. Yeah. yeah. 
the person to beat Magnus Carlsen is probably not going to be like a 40 year old, probably going to be like some 18 year old that comes right. out of like yeah, Hungary exactly. or something. Um, so, yeah, I think we should uh, I think we need to take that more seriously as a society. And that really addresses like that, you know, people IQ, whatever we want to characterize this, like, what you know, 140, 180. I, Vitala could be the smartest person I've ever mm-hmm. met. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, but I, I do think the one potential pushback against mm-hmm. the set of arguments you've made is that it seems like, and tell me if I'm wrong, yeah. that scientific discoveries yet to be made require a greater principle in terms of equipment and resources than they mm. might have a hundred years ago. Right. Is that true? And if that is true, can we do anything about the higher barriers to entry that would theoretically have to naturally come with with that reality? I think it's true of some fields mm-hmm. um, that require a lot, you know, capital expenses for labs, maybe particle colliders, mm-hmm. things of that nature. Um, but the, I, I do think there are other frontiers where uh, things are, are are still left unexplored and untested. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this could be everything from energy to uh, transportation to health. Um, things are getting cheaper. Uh, we we have a young man on the on the health side. You know, it, it, the, the typical story is that it's impossible to for a young person without credentials to make a contribution in biotech because it's like, how are you going to get the grants from the government? Uh, how are you going to do experiments with with expensive labs? And yet, I see the cost of these things falling to the degree now where you know younger people who can experiment in their mm-hmm. basement. And so, there's a young man we met. I mean, he fits our profile. In that, um, you know, he, he legally changed his name to Anthony Stark, Tony Stark, <laughs> when he was 18. And uh, we're, we're like, oh, my God, we're the only people who will take this <laughs> young man seriously because uh, he's calling himself Tony Stark. Well, yeah, in his parents' basement, he's interested in a certain uh, uh, a vector of using as a therapeutic using viruses to... Uh, to, to change certain things in the body. And, and one of the things he's been working on is a cure for type two diabetes. Now he's cured type two diabetes in mice. He's done it in rats. Next will be some kind of larger animal and then uh, human trials. And he started in a basement. We gave him 50 K. He was able to university of Michigan rents out their lab. Uh, and he was able to rent it and run some experiments there. So it's like he, he found a way to do it. Mm-hmm. Now he may, it may not work out, you know, oftentimes, mouse models don't translate to humans but still a good story uh, but yeah but he, he's making his way so i think it's more and more the case that okay we're chipping away like the cost of running experiments is decreasing and then there are areas where i'm just sort of flabbergasted i mean maybe things are more complex than they at first appear but when i think about something like diet it's like we're in the dark ages when it comes yeah. to diet we don't. There's an obesity epidemic yeah. in the world, not just America, mm-hmm. starting in the in the 70s, and it's not just humans. Mm-hmm. It's also weirdly like pets, yeah. and lab Tigers animals. Tigers are getting fat. Yeah, like it's a problem. <laughs> right. And the common story is that sugar is responsible, yeah. but when you look into the data, um, the sweet tooth theory isn't quite right because mm-hmm. um, s- sugar consumption has actually decreased in the last 10, 15 years. And yet that that rate is still going up. So is there some contaminant X mm-hmm. that's causing these things? It's a mystery. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, someone on the Ray Peep forums <laughs> is more likely to find out what it is than someone at the FDA. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Where and, and quite frankly, the government has been pushing the opposite of yeah. what's considered healthy yeah. for a long time yeah. with its food pyramid. Uh, so, yeah, I, those types of areas. I'm like, wow, there's just so much undiscovered country. Yeah. What was that? It was like like five to eight servings of like grain a day. And now the prevailing <laughs> wisdom is like as little grain grain as yeah, possible right. you know in the last 10 years or you say yeah and cereal boxes that were like sugar and wheat or something you know it's better than eggs trust <laughs> yeah. us <laughs> yeah um so, so so that makes sense um so you know we, we were talking about sort of these these most excellent people across yep. any field that are going to push the frontiers society forward i think i think a lot of people are on the same page about this right. these days at least in my like niche circle of crazy people um but um the the, the part that that seems less clear is yep, what yeah. do you do about you know the the kind of next stratum down the people who are smart? Yeah. Um, how is the system serving them poorly right now? Right. And what would a well calibrated civilization that that brings the best out of them look like? Yeah. Okay. Great. Great question. Uh, and where I get the greatest pushback mm-hmm. with what we do? Okay. Yeah. You back. You know the Navy SEALs or the Olympians. But what does this do for the normal American? Um, I think it begins in a story about college. 
where the standard story is that, um, you know, we can all agree that education pays. Mm -hmm. It is true that people with a college degree make more on average than people who don't have a college degree, just a high school degree. Um, the big question is why the standard story is that, um, the colleges teach skills and then those skills once imparted are rewarded in the labor market. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what everyone wants to believe. But there's a growing body of evidence from, uh, you know, it's it's a contested debate, uh, but there's a growing body of evidence among economists that um, college isn't actually imparting skills, it's doing something else. Mm -hmm. They call this the signaling theory. Mm -hmm. The idea is that not only do colleges select people who are already great at ripping apart arguments, reading, writing, mm -hmm. whatever, but what's more is that they're providing a four-year uh, program where at great expense, someone is willing to take assignments, finish them, get them done on time and uh, do this over quite a long period mm -hmm. of time. And that allows the labor market to just sort people mm -hmm. easier. So it's like, okay, we you need conscientious, high IQ uh, person or, you know, someone with some cognitive abilities. Mm -hmm. We can use uh, the college degree as a way to filter mm -hmm. the labor market. Um, I'm convinced by that theory. Mm -hmm. uh, anecdotally, I think we all know, and if I think of myself, I just told you a story to start the, this program. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do not pursue a career right now that uses the skills I learned in college. You know, I studied ancient Greek and philosophy. Um, I did not study venture capital finance. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other examples out there. We know lots of people, right, who studied French literature and now they're working as, you know, an accountant or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and then the next thing is that we all forget what we have learned in college. Uh, to use the foreign language example, I, I did study French and I don't remember much, <laughs> if anything, of it. Yeah. So it's weird to say that I'm being rewarded for skills that I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. And then the pushback is, oh, well, you didn't, it's not what you learned, it's how, you learned how to learn, mm -hmm. or you learned how to think. Mm -hmm. I didn't and do the, that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And so I think there's a class action lawsuit in the waiting here, because yeah. if you look at every mission statement of every yeah. college, it always starts off with some claim about, we don't teach you what to mm -hmm. think, we teach you how to think. Mm -hmm. Critical thinking mm -hmm. skills, leaders of tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. And not only is there no evidence, all right, for one thing, if this was a drug, the FDA would ban it. You cannot claim benefits <laughs> and then not show evidence that they're there. Yeah. So they currently provide none. Like, okay, you told us you were teaching critical thinking mm -hmm. skills. What's the evidence that you are? Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't test for that. You know, we don't mm -hmm. measure that. Well, okay, is that a benefit? Mm -hmm. And then there's evidence against it. So there is 90 years of research in the field of educational psychology on this question of what they call transfer of learning. Meaning if you learn one domain, can you extract lessons from that domain and then plot, apply them to a new problem or something mm -hmm. you encounter? Turns out there's no, we don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. Like there's no evidence colleges do mm -hmm. this or whatever. So the, the idea that colleges are like somehow imparting these intangible mm -hmm. skills, I am greatly, greatly mm -hmm. skeptical of based on that. I, I, so yeah. this is one of the most like heretical things that, that I believe is like, I, mm -hmm. I basically think all of like the gifted and talented programs in American elementary, <laughs> middle and high schools are horrific and bad, <laughs> um, largely because of the bleeding of this mentality down into yeah. early education it's, and this is maybe specifically a problem in like suburban middle class public schools is, is uh, I'll, I'll speak to just what i'm aware of yeah. um because it's it's funny like to me that like like every gifted and talented program in like fourth and fifth grade is like we're teaching kids how to think critical yeah. thinking and stuff <laughs> and it's like no you're teaching them to to have their head up the <laughs> that's that's what you're doing and 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 it's funny like yeah. in that moment in time when kids are so plastic like that is the moment in time to load them up with as right. much baseline information as possible yeah you know, throw 15 languages at them and see if you can get them to stick totally put them on as accelerated a math curriculum as possible so that they can just like be calc nerds by the age of 12 mm. or whatever like actually load them up in as many fundamentals and crunch it down right so that they can actually become critical thinkers but that you, you need yeah. you need a baseline of knowledge in order to critically think from instead we're teaching everyone to just create like this um 
uh, the, these like frameworks by which to analyze the world mm. as opposed to knowing anything about yeah. the world. And this is how you get something like wokeness is like people who don't actually know anything and just need to be able to like this right. is the reason why everyone at this table could like write a fake paper of like critical theory on any discipline. <laughs> if we wanted to, we could talk about why this cup is racist fairly yeah, easily right. is because all they're teaching is these like basic like scripts on how oh, to like totally. see the world as opposed to any actual baseline information. I just I just yeah, I hate the baseline of, of criticism and doubt, too. Mm. So. You could want to study the great works of literature, Shakespeare, yeah. Hamlet. Yeah. Are we going to somehow teach people yeah. to or somehow increase their res receptivity to beauty mm -hmm. in the form of a play? No. Instead, it's always just like queering Hamlet. Yeah. What, can, what critical <laughs> thing can we say yeah. about this play and write five pages on it and, yeah. and yeah. get a grade? Yeah. Yeah. I was in these uh, when I was in elementary school, like late elementary school, I was in these high potential programs and I'm like. Like, I don't know. I'm kind of a dumb. <laughs> like, I shouldn't have been in any of that. And I'm thinking back right now, like, yeah. as you're saying that to like all the books we read were these like novels about these like female Afghan refugees, right. you know, whatever. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it was all an odd, <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah. But I think, you know, speaking to the, the over credentialing of. Again, for lack of a better word, like midwit. Yeah, uh, I, I I can't think of a better industry for this than like human resources. Like, yeah, the most over credentialed, you know, spent well over six figures on their education. Yeah, complete idiots and <laughs> like unimaginative people that you've that you've ever met. I mean, it is. Like it's, it's, it's these frameworks of like how to deal with people and you get anyone that's kind of outside that paradigm. There's just no, yeah, there's just nothing like it, nothing happening like, between I, the years. Yeah. I don't even touch on the politics of things because I, I do think universities have become woke madrasas, mm -hmm. you know, they're ideological camps meant to indoctrinate mm -hmm. people, but I can leave that aside and just say they're actually, actually yeah. not even doing on their that own well terms. on their own terms. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Is like. The, to see in the last 10 years the critical theory mm -hmm. leave the academy mm -hmm. and find its way into the HR departments and mm -hmm. so on in major corporate that, that's been quite surprising mm -hmm. but I guess it was inevitable once once the wave came mm -hmm. um, so what's the answer um, if you buy the signaling theory then we shouldn't be subsidizing education to the degree that we do the government should should not be you know giving out grants and loans for people to enter this arms race that mm -hmm. isn't actually productive. Mm -hmm. is it, maybe an analogy there is if one person stands up in a theater at a, or at a stadium, okay, it improves that person's view, mm -hmm. uh, but then it forces everyone else to stand up and then we're back where we started. That's where the college degree is. There's so many careers where you don't need a college degree and yet now we require one. Think of like police officers and mm -hmm. so on. That's absurd that like, you know, 50 years ago, cops didn't need it mm -hmm. and there were great cops and like, I don't think that you know getting a degree in English literature ne necessarily makes you better on the beat. So what do I believe in instead? Um, so maybe for the midwits, we shouldn't be subsidizing the uh, surplus, mm -hmm. the overproduction of elites. Uh, on the other side, I, I look to two things. One would be there are examples out there where uh, countries have done a better job. Um, to some degree, Germany and Austria, but really the, the pinnacle is probably Switzerland. Mm -hmm. They have a robust apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. something like 70% of all teens participate in it. It doesn't just include manufacturing or the trades. It's also retail, finance, serious careers. Uh, and they make money doing it. They can make like a thousand bucks a, a month as a, as a teen. And it's enabled them to launch their careers, uh, learning by doing, learning on actually learning skills that are rewarded in the marketplace. Uh, and the upshot is they don't have an underclass of overeducated 20-somethings who mm. are indebted. So I, I, I think there are policy prescriptions that we could change. And you know, when we were just warming up before hit and record, you know, we were talking about apprenticeships. So could we find a way to subsidize apprenticeships, mm. learning by doing? And in Switzerland, it's like their work, we, their school week is a mix of some mm. classes, uh, meeting with advisor, mentor, uh, and this is all overseen by the state um, and then working. So, I mean, maybe maybe that could be the on ramp to a successful career for more people instead of trying to force everyone into this one colossal assembly line for some vague pre-professional degree. Mm -hmm. I just, in, you know, culturally, it's just it's shocking that we denigrate the trades mm -hmm. in America, that mm -hmm. you're just like tattooed as a mm -hmm. dunce because you didn't have a degree. That is just so wrong. Mm -hmm. So how many people have been forced onto that path? to go to college 
take on some debt, probably not even graduate and then be stuck with that afterwards. That That's just unjust. I mean, it's so it's yeah. so crazy. You're kind of getting this reversal of like, you know, what it what it actually means to, um, you know, be middle class. And they, yeah. you have a lot of these people, you know, we like joke, like we call them wage slaves, right? Like, yeah, you, like wagey wagey, get in your cage, you know, <laughs> like, like you're at your computer all Corporate day. Corporate cubicle yeah. donkey. Yeah. And you make, <laughs> you make like, you know, 50, 60 grand a year yeah. or whatever doing that. And then there are these, you know, guys going and, you know, starting their own plumbing companies and they're making well over oh, six yeah, figures right. a year. Um, so like almost all the guys uh, that I have doing stuff at, at my house, that's beyond my ability. Like as, as an example, um, you know, we had something wrong with our mm. um, uh, chimney masonry. So yeah. I was having like a chimney expert come out and fix it. Um, he can come and fix it in five months. Wow. Because there's like such a high yeah. demand. Like totally. nobody. And I was talking with one of my neighbors. I'm like, maybe I should quit my job. <laughs> and I should, we should like start a, a, yeah. a company that does like chimney masonry. Uh -huh. I don't know anything about it, but right. that this is why YouTube exists. You know, you I know. just learn stuff like that. Yeah. I live in the Colorado mountains and, mm. uh, contractors are so hard to come by and th and then you see them pull up in teslas so. <laughs> yeah and they're like the, like in, in these communities too. Yeah, yeah. The they're like the richest people you know totally you know? yeah i can't remember the, t the stat but it, there there is something where i saw like the average plumber makes more than the average doctor in some fields now if you count mm -hmm. the cost of medical school mm -hmm. and all the years yeah. um so yeah that, that's outrageous yeah. right i mean we we should see that as a noble profession that mm. people could mm -hmm. enter earlier on. So I, I think we could, so addressing this like mid uh, American idea, I think there are a lot of people who have been convinced mm. that college will help them and it, and it won't, and we should help them start their careers mm. by learning actual skills, mm. not like pretend skills that, you know, this vague critical mm. thinking thing. Yeah. Um, the last thing is I think, and maybe this is the most controversial, is I think this even applies to teenagers. I mean, I mentioned that the Swiss teens are in that, but it's like, I think by forcing some people to like, we view education as, like as a classroom mm -hmm. looking a certain way, you know, maybe that just doesn't serve everyone. You know, mm -hmm. I, young boys are being uh, drugged up now because mm -hmm. they can't sit still for so yeah. long. Well, you know, maybe for some people it's like, can we find something a, a different kind of path, maybe mm -hmm. towards trades, maybe towards mm -hmm. something else that mm -hmm. they actually find interesting earlier. Um, you know, so that's wading into like child labor. But mm -hmm. I, you know, it's like, I, if I'm going to say something, Sounds great. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I don't know, you know, ahead of time what, yeah. what your opinion will can, be. Can you imagine how much more annoying you'd be if you didn't have to do a bunch of hard labor in Honduras? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's, uh, so I, I, yeah. I grew up working on a, on a hog farm oh, no in, way. The, in the jungle okay, in yeah. Honduras. Yeah. So like 12, wow. like, so I did school half a day and then the other half a day I okay. worked in the, in the pig barns. So that's <laughs> there like, you go. I don't really know how to do anything, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, I'm curious to hear. And, and the, you know, this is kind of a, I guess, plays into that because I was, I was homeschooled, but I'm, mm. I'm, you get a lot of people. I think this is a really cringe opinion, honestly. Yeah. You, you know, people will say homeschooling will fix everything. <laughs> we just need to shut down all the, and yeah. like to the, to their credit, you know, some of the smartest people I know, my wife included, because yeah. I know she'll listen to this, uh, <laughs> were, were, were homeschooled. You know, right. they, you can really economize on the amount of things you can learn in a set period of time. Mm -hmm. So you're only doing, you know, like most people I know, uh, like at church, for example, mm -hmm. that do, um, homeschooling are uh doing it you know two or three hours a yeah. day and their kids are some of the smartest you know young yeah. young people i've ever met what what's what's the solution on the um you know like elementary and like secondary school aspect like yeah is it homeschooling is it uh, uh private schools some mix you know right can we I, say yeah, public I, schools i i uh yeah this is probably the most controversial topic right here awesome i think we should abolish the public schools mm -hmm. um i'm i'm gonna go that far i think both conservatives and libertarians have just like for too long accepted that socialism in education will work it doesn't we should know this mm -hmm. what happens under socialism is it's like there's a little kremlin in every town mm -hmm. it's the public school mm -hmm. and this isn't even with respect to the indoctrination stuff it's just like no one the field of education has not advanced talk mm -hmm. about technologies in terms of a social technology mm -hmm. we actually don't know how 
to teach people things or how to help them learn better. Mm -hmm. I did canvas a lot of this research and the people who study it are shocked at how little their techniques are adopted when it mm -hmm. comes to efficacy. Um, so that's shocking to me, but it's also a factor of like, you can't experiment in public schools. Mm -hmm. So we are spending more per student than any time in our country's history. If you add up all that local, state level, federal government money in K through 12, it's close to a trillion dollars mm -hmm. a year. That's quite substantial amount of money. In, in the government should not be in the production of education. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm definitely for, okay, uh, can we give vouchers to people? Can they experiment and use these in different ways? But the the last thing is just that, yeah, we don't know how people learn. So how do we cre increase experimentation? The public yeah. school system isn't doing it. California, uh, there's some crazy stat that something like 23% of all Californian adults are functionally illiterate. They can read some things, but they can't read contracts and so on. All right. That is an indictment of our education system. Yeah. We are not preparing people for citizenship mm -hmm. if they can't read. And so uh, it's not like more money is not going to help. So that's why I'm getting all worked mm -hmm. up about this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting so angry. It's like, this is not working. We got to try something different. Mm -hmm. I, I will mm -hmm. say great second book title. A Kremlin in every town. <laughs> it's just bookmark that. <laughs> Your local elementary school is the longhouse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what would emerge in a system where uh, people could spend money in different ways and it wasn't so regulated? I mean, there would be homeschooling. There would be pods. There could be little schoolhouses. Mm. There could be like people who teach one thing and mm -hmm. not another. I, it's mm. like we just see a, a pro proliferation of different styles, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. Uh, but currently, it's just this factory model that, that everyone marches to the mm -hmm. same step. I mean, just step into a classroom. It's dreadful. Mm -hmm. Like the, the scalding fluorescent lights over your head, mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the desks in a row. I, it's like, I, how are people not more upset about this? I don't know, because it's just been the same for so long. Well, because it's daycare. Yeah. yeah. That's right. yeah. Oh, well, that's yeah. the key thing, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like really what we're talking about is daycare. Yeah. 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 So this is another category of thing where like the reason most people are upset about it is is a different reason than I'm upset about it, but equally so is that I think one of the most dangerous things about the system uh, of education that we've laid out from K through 16, if you count undergrad, yeah. is that children spend most of their time around either people much, much, much older than them, parents mm. and teachers, or people basically exactly their same age. Yeah. Uh, and the I think there are enormous, heavily under-indexed social consequences that come out of this, especially in a world where people are in smaller and smaller families. They're yeah. only children, or maybe they have one sibling, is that... Um, there is no script except for the script that the system provides you for mm. what aging looks like. And so as you have the proliferation of longer and longer educational timelines, you got to get a bachelor's, you got to get a master's. Yeah, you gotta, right. Basically, like not only have we extended adolescence, but we've extended adolescence for everyone yeah. because it's it's lowest common denominator. So there's, uh, you know, high school is designed to get some kids into college and college is designed to make them into adults. Therefore, no one in high school is an adult because they're not around adults because yeah. they don't know what those look like. I mean, that's spot on. I think that's right is yeah. that you, if you're 18, suddenly all the 19 year olds mm -hmm. are gone. Mm -hmm. They're off at college mm -hmm. or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and, and there aren't good role model mm -hmm. examples, not at a... Michael Jordan level, but at like a near level mm -hmm. to you where you're like, oh, maybe that's a, that's a path I could mm -hmm. take in my life that that I actually find charismatic yeah. because Joe's a cool guy. And mm -hmm. I, I like, you know, looking at what he does. I think you're so right. Well, and this goes yeah. back to, I think, one of the, the coolest parts about the Teal Fellowship or uh, or the work you're doing at, at 1517 Fund is that. You know, pe people don't know how much weight they can carry until you add another plate. And so mm. if, if you have this thesis for identifying this exceptional talent that that could potentially carry much more than, than people typically expect out of a 17 or an 18 year old, and you put them in an environment of people who, you know, maybe they're older, they're in their 20s or 30s, who also have founded companies, turns out. They could probably just blend right in, like, yeah. and, and, and unless like <laughs> yes. you really know, yeah. like unless they look obviously younger right. than everyone else, you might not even know um, uh, that they are. Yeah. And, and and we have nothing in society that is designed to help make that happen. At best, there is a program that might let you get the next grade up math class, mm -hmm. but that's it. Yeah, to go back to the homeschooling thing, we saw a lot of people come through the fellowship and now with 15, 17 who are homeschooled. Mm -hmm. And what we noticed was they just had an easier time interacting with adults. Mm -hmm. I think there's something about the homeschooling world where mm -hmm. there's less of this sort of authority figure mm -hmm. student dynamic and you're mixed up with other people mm -hmm. of different ages. Um, and then there's the lack of structure. Mm -hmm. So like that Intel science award winner 
didn't survive well in the wild because they're just used to working within an existing structure mm -hmm. that has clear mm -hmm. objectives and assignments and so on. Um, so I, I, I think it would serve all of society mm -hmm. to look more like mm -hmm. the homeschooling style mm -hmm. for the reasons you mentioned. It's, it's strange to me that there's this, like you're going to march lockstep with everyone who's your age, yeah. pretty much that 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 is. I mean, that's everyone should, should scratch their head, wondering why yeah. that would be the case. Yeah. So yeah. The, the the upshot of everything that you're saying yeah. is that you know this we have this horrific education system from K through 12 and beyond, um, and that it's completely poorly serving people, our economy, and the future of innovation. Even if we fixed everything tomorrow, yeah, there'd be 150 million people that went through that system. Right. You know, if you call that system what has existed over the last 40 years, roughly, uh, is there any hope for them? Are they just going to be this like basket case, like generation yeah. in history? Even if we fix everything, it's like the one ring of the tree that looks like kind of grody and like, <laughs> you know, diseased. Like what's, is there any way to redeem the people whose brain was poisoned by this system? I don't know. That's a, <laughs> wow. That's a great question. Yeah. There's a bit of a Stockholm syndrome yeah. thing where, and you see this with, uh, Eastern Europeans and Cubans, yeah, <laughs> these people who lived under Soviet communism, yeah. and then uh, maybe for good reasons, it's like yeah. they live in a, a chaotic time, and then they long for the stability. Of, yeah. of They're the like, yeah, days. we hate those people. Yeah. We should just yeah. kill them. Yeah, like, yeah well, and, and all these people live under Kremlin Primary School in the United yeah. States now. So, like, what, what's the answer for? Them? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a. Good, that's a great question. I don't have an answer for. Um, other than other than to say, I think people's reflexes will be against change just because they mm. went through the system themselves. Um, but I, but I think you know my advice to anyone is um, that you have to take the idea of skills seriously. Mm. You know what you want to do in life. Make sure you know you you pick up the skills to do it. Mm. Find you know among firms the ones that that do what you want to do the best among them, mm. and see if you can get a job there and pick up the skills you want. Um, and, and, and don't trust authorities. Um, the, uh, it, it's like, yeah, it's like, is this, is this piece of paper meaningful? Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's telling me I need to get it. What is it actually, what's the substance behind it? Mm -hmm. I think that's my advice to anyone. Um, if you're in debt, you know, there's this, uh, case working its way. The Supreme court's going to hear it in February. Uh, the Biden administration is trying to cancel student debt. Um, I think it's somewhere on the order of like 400 mil billion. Mm -hmm. Um, and on the one hand, I do feel for the people who were conned or, you know, kind of sold a false bill of goods. Um, but on the other hand, it's like, you know, can we really ask people who didn't go to college to subsidize those mm -hmm. useless degrees? Can we ask the people who did go and, and work their ass off or parents who paid? Um, that's That seems unfair. Um, and then the next thing is like not blaming the culprit. You know, the universities are to blame for the cost. So if we forgive debt this year, what do we do in five years or 10 Size years? Size of the Harvard endowment. <laughs> or, or, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, so maybe we should- Pay it out of that. Right. <laughs> um, so, so those types of things, uh, those, those are going to be the real political issues, I think, that bring this up in the next you know, month or two. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's going to be pushback. Because I think a lot of people, though, still have, are wedded to this mm -hmm. idea that they have skills that they learned in college. And, and like on the left- Bernie Sanders wants to make college free. Uh, and it's all on this model that people are learning skills in college. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, <laughs> like, we just doubt the main premise mm -hmm. of the idea. It's like, wait, should we be paying people to um, participate in that signaling arms race? Okay, maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's going to be tough to reform. What we try to do is provide a path for people who are not part of that. Yeah. And we hope through... Uh, you know, adjacent and age role models that, you know, it'll give people more ideas that they can start their careers and, and then being on your show and like just talking about it, you know, I hope more and more people peel off. What's Cardwell's law. Okay. So yeah, that ties to the idea of scientific stagnation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's really pompous, but uh, I, I wanted this, my book to also just be a meditation on creativity because mm -hmm. it is so mysterious. Mm -hmm. It's one of these things that we know little about mm -hmm. when you read the psycho. Uh, the again the research psychology of creativity is pretty lame. Mm -hmm. You see um, studies where they ask people like how many things can you do with this brick and mm -hmm. like correlate that <laughs> with you know, how many jokes they can tell or something. Right? Yeah, not not cool. Um, and, and and so it dawned on me. Okay, we don't know why individuals are creative. We don't even know why. And then the other thing is like okay, we don't even know why certain clusters are creative because it seems to be geographic. Mm -hmm. You think of 
uh, the flourishing of ancient Athens, uh, the ploy writing, the mathematics, the philosophy, and then it disappeared. Mm -hmm. Renaissance Italy, uh, maybe even painting in Paris in the 20s, right? There, there's a life cycle to a cluster mm -hmm. where it seems like a specific place becomes creative, it flowers, and then it fades. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also true of nations. So Cardwell's law is that known country stays at the frontier of technology forever. No one is the most creative technologically, and that's through history. Mm. Um, so it could be the British Empire in the 19th century was at the mm. forefront, and then the torch was passed to America for the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So Cardwell was a historian of technology who, who, who noticed this fact. Uh, so it dawned on me that uh, people are don't really think about that rate of progress as it's driven by creativity of a nation. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't think about it in nation by nation comparisons. So it's interesting, like why the U S is more creative than Canada mm -hmm. or even Europe. And we could like go down into the thickets of culture and laws mm -hmm. and policy. And then people don't really think about the same nation over time. And, and that stagnation thesis is that we used to be more creative than mm -hmm. we are now. And so my book, I, I, I tell, I tell stories. I told you, I, I want to be a writer. Um, and I start with the personal. Mm -hmm. I start with individuals. We judged individuals. I told you one thing we look for in individuals. But I also I saw in my 10 years in living in San Francisco in 2010, San Francisco was going to be the digital Athens. It was going to be this incredible city of ambition that summoned talent from all over the world to build the future. And by the end of the decade, it had been destroyed. So we don't know how these creative clusters form. Silicon Valley is certainly a blessing, but we know how to kill these things. And I saw it happen in San Francisco. And then as a nation as a whole, we have to ask, mm -hmm. are we doing the right thing when it comes to advancing science and tech? And, and yeah, I, I, I don't think we are. Is that life cycle in our hands? Is that something that can be changed? Yeah, it's very hard. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we talked about individuals that they get older and stuck in their ways, perhaps. Mm -hmm. There's something where they're less agile. Well, that, that life cycle seems to apply to institutions mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. NASA was phenomenal mm -hmm. at its advances in the 60s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, get a moon, a man on the moon in a decade. Mm -hmm. Well, now NASA, you know, it does some good things, but we can all agree it's pretty bloated and mm -hmm. slow. And for the amount of money that they have compared to SpaceX alone, it's remarkable how little they get accomplished. So institutions have a life cycle. Um, maybe cities do too. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe states. Um, the historian Joel Moiker uh, has studied this phenomenon, and what he he noticed was, you know, China was at the peak of technological progress in 1500: gunpowder, ocean-going vessels, printing presses, um, and then fell great, fast too. Um, whereas Europe started its long march to the frontier and, and its advances. And, and the one thing he, he points out is that the, in China, the emperor, if he prohibited something, it was prohibited across the whole continent. Mm. So he suddenly decided no more uh, sea exploration and, and no ships could be built. Um, whereas in Europe, you had this frontier of uh, enclaves, rel religious minor weird religious minorities and sex, mm -hmm. castles, kingdoms, fiefdoms, city states, mm -hmm. uh, nations, um, and uh, all that political those borders and political competition actually worked to advance progress mm -hmm. because if you banned something in your kingdom, uh, well, there's a good chance that that person would leave your kingdom and go somewhere else where they were welcomed. Uh, so that created an arms race on that front where it was like, okay, we can't lose talent. So it weirdly in a sense is uh, I'm, I'm very uh, libertarian by nature. And I think libertarians have been, uh, wrong to uh, not think of the importance of national borders. You know, that's something I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, conservatives have, have been more aware of mm -hmm. in the last decade. Um, but I think one because of, the, of their utility in helping create a little separation. Well, opportunities yeah, exactly. For more degrees of freedom and things. to Yeah. Flourish. So I, it's like maybe the strongest mm -hmm. case for patriotism and mm -hmm. nationalism is actually the innovation mm -hmm. and, and progress is yeah. that um, by by closing yourself off to some yeah. degree, you protect uh, yourself from, uh, you know, one world state that yeah. might decide to overregulate everything and stop it. This, this is yeah. why I, I think that the best thing that could happen this decade is um, uh, the rapid fracturing of the Internet into yeah. sovereign um, enclaves. Right. Uh, because it's clear that like 
the woke mind virus to use the cringiest possible term for it <laughs> is like it has a very high like level of transmission mm -hmm. and so if it transmits through the internet then just like shatter the internet to yeah. like hope something survives somewhere and like right. not everything becomes like fake um and lame um yeah, yeah I, th I think covid was a good test run for this yeah. it was remarkable how harmonized the world's policies became yeah. and any deviation from that was sacrilegious yeah. sweden Florida, mm -hmm. they decided to do something different, and, yeah. and that's seen as sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. um, Davos was just uh, last week, and I think it's clear, like, the Davos man is still alive, mm -hmm. someone for whom national borders mean nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and and, uh, and there's something I find very sinister about uh, that universalism, mm -hmm. that, you know, what, what the Davos uh, leadership decides is world policy should be mm -hmm. policy everywhere. That will kill innovation in the long run. Yeah. There, there, there could be it could be the case that okay at the beginning there's some synergies or whatever bigger markets mm -hmm. for people but uh what is clear is that these institutions get old and then when they do they they you know only protect vested interests and it's hard to do anything new mm -hmm. so um i really do think there is a danger of a one world government and um you know libertarians i think would do well to uh you know, be more cautious, uh, even with these free trade agreements, you know, mm -hmm. as a free trade zealot, it's like, okay, m should we be careful here though, mm -hmm. by joining the, you know, uniting the world in mm -hmm. greater and greater uh, polities, are we diminishing our ability mm -hmm. to protect ourselves from mm -hmm. old institutions and laws that might wipe us out? Yeah. Yeah. So would you be long America? Uh, do you think that, well, what's more likely that we are able to hold on to or revivify our ability to be the epicenter of creativity and innovation or that somewhere else is going to get it and if if you do think that there's somewhere else likely where where should we be looking to what's what's the place where you think creativity might flourish anew i think uh, there is something still special about america mm -hmm. it, it when i look at different countries i mean they they, they do create companies and they do have, have scientists making discoveries but by comparison it's just not we are still at the forefront mm -hmm. but it seems to be diminishing right yeah um the question is can we reform the government and its mm -hmm. institutions i'm very negative on that. yeah um so i i don't know what the, the you know within and within the geographic us i think there's a lot of ruin in a nation and so it'll still you know even though we're on the decline i think i think there's still hope that you know maybe there things can change the one thing i hope is that the decreasing cost of production into, or call it like the cost of running experiments, of doing new things. Maybe that lowers to the point where smaller groups of people can actually make important mm -hmm. contributions. Um, in in which case, maybe the U.S. is just saved mm -hmm. by its own devices. About like by the, it's like okay, things are slowing down, institutions are degrading, but still it has dynamic people and is drawing the best mm -hmm. talent in the world. Where, and if you go issue by issue, I think. Yeah, at the end of my book, I go through what I think are the unsolved challenges and across different fields. And I, I think the U.S. would be in a pretty good spot. I'm not going to tell people like, hey, this is going to teach you how to live, how to deal with death and how to love like the meaning of life. But by God, if we solve these issues, I think the country could be in a good place. It could be energy creation. That could be nuclear fusion. It could be um, in healthcare if we... Uh, stem, if, you know, a lot of age, a lot of diseases are aging related. Um, and if we find a way to slow down the biological clock so that cancer, heart disease, these things don't emerge, that's going to take a huge weight mm -hmm. off the American, uh, unfunded liabilities, mm -hmm. especially like the Medicare or Medicaid stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. maybe these types of things could save us. Mm -hmm. Um, education, you know, maybe mm -hmm. people learn skills. It's like, if we find ways to, to do these things, maybe some of the bigger problems that are looming on the horizon aren't as bad. But if not the U.S., then you know, I I, I do I, I I do spend time with the uh, the network state type people, the 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 city state charter city crowd. There's an effort in Honduras of all places, mm -hmm. but on the island of Roatan, Prospera. Yeah, they're they're going through a strong stress mm -hmm. test right now, where. The, the socialist communist Honduran president is doing her best to destroy this place and it seems to be surviving. So maybe these enclaves emerge mm. where, uh, you know, new things can be done. And, and maybe that provides a competitive pressure on the U.S. Um, I don't know. We'll just have to see. 
but I don't think, you know, it's not the cloud. I don't, it's like, I think people are going to have to live somewhere yeah. and interact. Yeah. Yeah. That's the fight I get into with biology most. I'm like, uh, people need uh, so- soil, a place to stand <laughs> yes. on, and uh, families, and like, you know, like right. kinship and blood still matter. Sorry, like, I just uh, these, 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 this is the reality of the world we live in. Um, um, you know, the 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 keto community is not going to become a country. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry, but no, I I, I think yeah. that's. Um, but I do. Th- it is a race between technology and politics, mm-hmm. where. Either we make these advances in it and we save ourselves or, you know, the politics just becomes too much. And yeah. and we just, you know, it's a, what, what is that moment on a flight where yeah. the captain says, you know, uh, put the trays up in your seat in the upright position. <laughs> that could be <laughs> the moment, you know, we, we've reached that declining. Mm-hmm. We're coming into our final descent. <laughs> yeah. Get, get the life vests, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Michael, where can people keep up with everything that you are saying and doing and, uh, and up to? Uh, yeah, on Twitter, I, I, as a journalist back in 27, mm-hmm. 2007, I signed up early. I thought it was a site for haikus. Mm-hmm. I, I have the, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Is 140 of characters enough? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, so my handle is at William Blake, the poet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have such a generic name, Michael Gibson. So I, I just rolled with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, find me on Twitter, 1517fun.com. People have ideas. They want to talk to us. We have a contact form. Fill it out. We give out $1,000 grants to people uh, if they need some parts to build a prototype, test something out. That's no strings attached. And then we make investments. Um, and then, um, yeah, if you can't find me on Twitter or at 1517fund.com, I don't know, maybe look for me on campus somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to bait people to leave. <laughs> yes. yeah. Well, Michael, thank you for coming on the podcast and everything you do. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. It was certainly a lot of fun for us to tape. Uh, always uh, worth following the 1517 Fund people on Twitter. I think Michael's at William Blake, Zach Slayback, uh, Daniel Strachman. They're they're all patriots and uh, really interesting people. I, in general, am a fan of being on tech Twitter. You'll learn something. It's certainly a lot more edifying than political Twitter a lot of the time. Um, as always, be sure to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything we have cooking. Uh, be sure to rate and review this podcast. I think we're like at 140 something uh reviews if uh you give us more um nick gets to eat um and so it's uh, it's very good for him email him if you have any complaints um nick at americanmoment.org uh, and if you submit a uh, question with your five-star review we'll be sure to answer it on this show uh, thank you guys as always for listening uh we're excited to be well into season three and uh, we will see you guys next week Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more. Moment of Truth.